Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us Jesus Christ. And we know he's sufficient for every life. We know that in your love you have given us Christ so that he will become fully a satisfaction spiritually, physically, materially, because he supplies all things into our lives. And we are praying that in practical ways we'll find out by experience that is all we need in Jesus name. We pray that your spirit will take the words we are learning today from your word and burn it into our heart. It will remain indelible in us and make us the kind of people we ought to be in Jesus name. Help us to completely rely upon you, to trust you fully, to depend upon you in everything. And find that you are the sufficient supply of all our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. We welcome everyone to the Bible study once again today in Jesus' name. For those who may be coming for the first time, we meet here on Mondays. And we study the word of God because this is the very strength of the Christian life. And for those who have been coming before, I want to encourage you to keep coming. There is no substitute. There is no other thing that can take the place of Bible study in the life of a believer. We have come to chapter 13 of the epistle of Paul to the Hebrews. And you will find that in this chapter we have a series of commandments. And they show what a Christian ought to be. And what a Christian ought to be doing. We are looking at verses 5 and 6 today. You will find in these two verses, you will find exhortation, you will find encouragement, and then you will find the expression of the confidence of a child of God in the all-sufficient supply of our Almighty God. Look at it in verse 5. The exhortation, let your conversation be without covetousness. And here we have an encouragement, be content with such things as ye have. The encouragement continues, he says, For he has said, I will never leave thee, and I will never forsake thee. And now we have the expression of our confidence in the might, in the all-sufficient provision of the Lord, and the protection of the Lord, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. And there are three things that stand out very clearly in the verses we have read. There is a warning against covetousness. And yet there is a watchword for the believer, which is talking about contentment. And then we find the promise, the word of our constant companion that says, I'll never leave you, I will never forsake you. As we come to the Lord at the point of conversion, we begin to walk with the Lord. And there is great peace in our hearts. And as we continually walk with the Lord, we find a lot of blessings in our lives. Trusting Him, depending upon Him, we enjoy the promises of the Lord. And there is contentment in our lives. To be contented means we're satisfied. Because we know that He is all that we need. And we know that He is good. And we know that He adequately cares for the people that trust in Him. In his omniscience, he knows all that we need. And because we know that characteristic of the Lord, there is no envy in our hearts, there is no discontent in our life, there is no jealousy in us, we lean completely upon him, we are satisfied with him, we are contented in him. While we are thanking him for what we have, we are looking up to him for what we do not have, and then we are waiting patiently until he will see best to provide those things for us. So we find contentment in the life of the believer. In the unbeliever, it's the opposite of contentment. And it is covetousness that we find in the world. Covetousness is an attitude. The attitude of wanting to acquire things, longing for them, setting our thoughts on them, and then are giving attention to them. Whether we possess them or not, there is that longing, desire, pursuit, wanting to have. And there is something that the people who are learned, they call the law of diminishing returns. Greed and covetousness, they follow such a principle. It's a principle of increasing desire and decreasing satisfaction. And that is, 
the desire, the increasing desire, and the more they have, the less satisfaction they have. It is covetousness that makes the people of the world to look and focus on money and material things. It is contentment in the life of the believer that makes him to focus on the Lord. For the people of the world, the more they get, the less they, the more they want. They are never satisfied. But there is great danger in covetousness. There is great gain in contentment. And there is great peace knowing that Christ, our companion, is ever with us. That's why I want to go through the scriptures and look at those three things. One, the warning against covetousness. Two, the watchword, which is contentment. Number three is the word and the promise of our companion. And let's look at the beginning of verse five. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Uh, if you're a student of uh, the New Testament, you will find that the word conversation here is an all-encompassing word. In the use of the English language of the present day, when we say conversation, we're talking of communication. What we say out of the mouth, our discussion. But you see at the time that the uh, King James Version of the Bible was uh, translated, conversation means your manner of life, your attitude, your action, the totality of your life. So what this is saying is, let your conversation, your conduct, your character, your manner of life, the characteristic we know about you, let it be without covetousness. They're talking about covetousness. It's a commandment of the Lord from the Old Testament. If you look at Exodus chapter 20 and in verse 17, it's very direct. And the word of the Lord is given to every individual believer. It says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not covet his, uh, man, his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Here he talks about the possession of your neighbor. He talks about the people belonging to your neighbor. He talks about the privilege belonging to your neighbor. He says for the people belonging to your neighbor, a wife, a servant, a maidservant, Anyone belonging to your neighbor, serving your neighbor, and is serving them well, you will not covet them and say, I wish those people would be mine. Concerning the possession of your neighbor, it says, you will not covet the house of your neighbor, the property of your neighbor. And concerning the work that he's doing, if he has us, if he has us, he says you will not be covet of what belongs to the other one, thinking, I wish those things were mine. Does he have a position in the place of work you don't have? Don't be envious. Does he have a privilege in the church you don't have? Don't be envious. You will not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. And so we find the commandment of the Lord that we should not covet because covetousness carries wrath of God, damnation of God, condemnation, judgment from God. In Psalm 10 verse 3, For the wicked boasted of his heart's desire, and he blesses the covetous whom the Lord abhorred. Uh, you see here, we are told that the covetous person is abhorred by the Lord, is detested by the Lord, is rejected by the Lord, is an abomination unto the Lord. You see, covetousness spoils your testimony. It cancels the assurance to say you have that you are a believer because you are an abomination before the Lord if there is covetousness in the heart. In First Timothy chapter 6, reading from verse 9. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. He had been talking about contentment from verse 6. And in verse 8, he still emphasizes contentment. And now he brings up the matter of covetousness, which is the opposite of contentment. In verse 9, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and snare, and into many foolish and hurtful laws, which drown men in destruction and perdition. They that will be rich as early as quick as possible. The people that make money an idol. The people that pursue money and they forsake God. The people that forsake family and they pursue money. The people that will be rich at all costs, now, now. 
they fall into temptation and snare and they get into foolish hurtful deals with others eventually they drown themselves in destruction and perdition for the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith they are backslidden and they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows covetousness is the opposite of contentment as i told you it is a consuming desire to have the things of the world it is lusting after what god has forbidden or what god is withholding from us it is craving after something having abnormal desires for that thing and that thing becomes an idol in the heart the people who are ruled who are governed by this kind of thing by covetousness they adore they worship gold they put their trust in it as money becomes an idol that's why the bible calls the covetous people idolaters in colossians chapter 3 verse 5 it says mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth fornication uncleanness inordinate affection evil concupiscence and covetousness which is idolatry and you will see that he mentions fornication he mentions for covetousness he mentions uncleanness he mentions covetousness it is the same tree of evil that produces all those fruits whether it's fornication or it's uncleanness or it's inordinate affection or evil concupiscence or covetousness they come from the same root of evil when he talks of evil concupiscence you may not understand that word con concupiscence it's like conception it's like a person that is pregnant of evil there is evil within and is meditating on that evil is brooding over that evil and like pregnancy develops that conception of evil that plan of evil that thought of evil is expanding 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 until eventually he will give birth to evil which is seen the evil is within that's the conception that's the concupiscence and eventually it will yield into outward sin and it tells us covetousness is idolatry and then it says in verses for which things sake the wrath of god cometh on the children of disobedience in ephesians chapter 5 the lord is telling us the same thing in verse uh, in verse uh, 3 but fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness let it not be once named among you as become a saints many years ago a uh, spurgeon was a pastor of a large uh, growing church and after ministry for many many years he said that i've been counseling people and many of the people have been coming and they will say uh, I'm, I'm backsliding i want to recover my way before the lord and they may confess adultery or may confess fornication or may confess another sin he said for many many years he never found the people confessing their sin of covetousness it shows the lack of understanding even today many people do not realize that in the sight of god covetousness is as dirty is as abominable is as deadly as fornication and uncleanness the attitude that is never satisfied with what god has given i've got this but i'm not satisfied how about that one and that thing may become such a habit that every time you have money in your hand you go to the market and until you spend everything and buy all the clothes that are there you'll never rest until you buy all the books that are there you'll never rest until you buy whatever it is that is there you'll never rest the covetousness is wanting more and wanting more and wanting more and covetousness is a deadly terrible sin in the sight of god look at verse 5 for this ye know that no armonger, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. As we talk about covetousness, you will remember Achan. He, he said, I saw it, I coveted it, I took it. You will remember Ahab. He had the son vineyard, but he wanted the vineyard of Naboth. You will remember Balaam. The Lord told him not to go, but because of covetousness, he wanted that money, he wanted that gift by all costs, he went, and the Lord said his way was perverse before him. You will remember Gehazi, the servant of Elisha. 
because of covetousness, they ran after Naaman to get the changes or the suits of clothes, and then eventually the leprosy of Naaman came upon him. You will remember Judas Iscariot. Because of 30 pieces of silver, he sold his master, he sold the Savior and Lord, and then now he is a hellfire. If there is covetousness in our hearts, if that is a characteristic, we cannot get to the kingdom of God. Because we are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Who are the unrighteous people? It tells us from verse 9, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, the effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, thieves, Covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You see here, the covetous people are grouped with the worst of sinners. That's why we need to pray in the language of Psalm 119. In Psalm 119 verse 36, Incline mine heart unto thy testimonies, not to covetousness. Incline mine heart unto thy testimonies, unto your promises, and let me wait upon the Lord. Let me keep on depending upon the Lord. Help me not to depend, not to focus my attention on the things of the world. Incline not my heart to covetousness. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity, quicken thou me in thy way. You see the exhortation the apostle is giving us? You see the warning that the apostle is giving us? Let your conversation be without covetousness. That is, your character, your conduct, your manner of life, let it be without covetousness. What's the thing that the believer should think about? That leads us to point number two now. A watchword, which is contentment. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. Be content, be satisfied. Are you married? Be satisfied with your wife. Don't look outside. You are married, let your husband please you and be satisfied with your husband. Don't desire another woman's husband. You are using a brand of car. Another person is using another brand of car. Be satisfied, be content with the things that you have. You have a moderate position, privilege in the church. Be satisfied with the position, privilege you have. Don't envy others. Don't be jealous of others. And don't be covetous. Be satisfied and be content with what you have. The Lord has given you some clothes you are wearing. And you are neat and you are alright. Until you saw another person that appeared to be better dressed than you have. Don't allow jealousy to come in now. Be satisfied. Be content with some things as you have. You are happy with your children until you hear about another person's child that has gone to university. And then dissatisfaction will come in. And discontent will come in. Be satisfied with what you have. It says, be content with such things as ye have. That is the contentment that should be in the life of the believer. And uh, we're told in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, reading from verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, reading from verse 6. It says, but godliness with, about godliness with contentment is great gain. But you need to understand that verse very well. Godliness with contentment, conversion with contentment, Christian living with contentment, sanctification, holiness with contentment is great gain. On the other hand, contentment without godliness is a great loss. If you have not been saved, how can you be satisfied and say, I'm alright the way I am. You are not alright if you are not born again yet. Contentment without godliness is a great loss. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. You cannot be satisfied. You cannot be contented without holiness because contentment without holiness is going to be an eternal loss. But if you are born again, if you are a child of God, if that holiness is there already, godliness with contentment is great gain. 
This contentment is the tranquility of the soul. It is being satisfied with the place God has put me. Satisfied with the things that the Lord has apportioned unto me. It is knowing that the will of God and the time of God is the best, is wiser than I am. The literally gives me now, if he believe, if he thinks that that is the best for me now, that will be okay for my spiritual life, my will is swallowed up in the will of God. I say, thank you, Lord. You know this is what I need, and I'm waiting for the rest. I will wait patiently. That's contentment. And you can only have that contentment when you are crucified to the world, and the world is crucified to you. And you are dead to the world. You are weaned from the world like a little child is weaned from breast milk. It is when your affections are set on things above, not on things on earth, you'll be able to have contentment. When you have contentment, you'll be able to stay on that job and you'll be waiting until you are promoted. You'll not be in a hurry. You start now, you resign. After three months, you got another job. You resign. After six months, you get another one. You resign. After about six months, you say, I don't even want to work with anybody. I want to ride uh, this kind of vehicle. There is no contentment. You will not be able to stay somewhere. There must be contentment in the life of a believer. For godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. He's talking about material things. The only thing you'll be able to carry out from here, your salvation. The only thing you can carry away from here, your sanctification, your holiness of life. The only thing you can carry out of here, the power of God, the Spirit of God abiding with you, and your faithfulness in the work of the Lord. That will be waiting for you, and when you get there, the Lord will say, because you have been faithful in a little thing, I'll make you ruler over many things. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content, satisfied. If we obey that verse, we'll never backslide. Because I've not got a vehicle, I can't be a Christian anymore. I want to go and pursue what the other people are getting. If we understand this, having food and clothing, let us be there with content. We'll never backslide. In Luke chapter 3 verse 14. Luke chapter 3 verse 14. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. Be content with your wages. The people of the world, they are never content, and therefore they will be rioting. They want to destroy everything, and they want to dis uh, scatter the management because of increase of salary. We cannot do that. In that place of work, you will be content with your wages until the Lord himself will bring a change. Colossians chapter 3 from verse 1. Uh, these are the things that show us how a Christian, a believer, will have contentment. Because that contentment is coming out of the heart that is totally focusing on God, relying on God, depending upon God. If ye then be risen with Christ, see, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Here there is no competition. When you are seeking things above, you want to be spiritual, you want to be sanctified, you want to be consecrated, you want to be faithful to the Lord. Nobody is competing with you. The field is yours. You want revival in your soul. You want to really lean upon the Lord. You want to serve the Lord to the very limit. You want to seek those things which are above. Here there is no competition. Nobody is going to compete with you. You can seek the Lord and seek to the, the Lord to the limit that you want. And this is what will cancel covetousness from the heart. And it says, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. When we focus on material things, we get into trouble. When we begin to look at the unbelievers in our places of work, in our community, see what they have got, see what they have got, we begin to turn our eyes away from the Lord. When material things, property and possession, when they become so pronounced in our lives, then our vision of heaven becomes clouded.
And then our dreams will be about walking somewhere, about going to America, about going to Japan, about riding a car, about uh, building a house in the village, about this and that. We never dream, dream about the rapture because we're not setting our affections on things above. Covetousness will then go through our hearts in a crack that have been made available by our spiritual life. But when you set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth, there will be contentment. There will be no covetousness. Righteousness. It says, for ye are dead, and your life is seed with Christ in God. When we are dead to the things of the world, there will be no covetousness. We will not be competing with those unbelievers and going behind those unbelievers to even blackmail them before our boss so we can take a particular position. There will be nothing like that when we are dead to the world. It says, for, for ye are dead, and your life is seed with Christ in God. Actually, why should we be covetous like the people of the world? Don't we have the promise of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, the provision of the Lord, and the great things the Lord has provided for the people of God, if we will rest on them and wait patiently until God will give them, there will be no covetousness at all, there will be contentment in your life and in my life. Look at the life we ought to live in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5. This is what shows who a Christian really is. A person who knows the omnipotence of God, who knows the omniscience of God, who knows the power of God and the wisdom of God. A person who is leaning upon the Lord and he knows there can be no disappointment. Look at verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Be content with such things as ye have. Why? For he has said. Why? Why are we to live without covetousness? Why are we to be content with such things as we have? Because the Almighty has said. Because our great provider has said. Because the one that knows our need before we ask, because he has said. Because the one who is the father in the family that we belong to, because he has said. The one that fed the millions of the children of Israel in the wilderness, because he has said. The one that protected the children of Israel, that all the scorpions and all the snakes and the lions in the wilderness will not bite them, will not destroy them, the protector, the provider, because he has said. It is one when we forget what the Lord has said, that covetousness will creep into our hearts. It is when we forget what our Almighty God, our Father, what He has said, and what He has provided for us, we begin to compete with the people of the world, as if, if I don't hurry up, if I don't demand what I need, the people are going to cheat me, I will not have anything in life. It is when we forget the promise of the Lord that we begin to compete with those people in the world. Look at what He said, I will never leave thee, I will never forsake you. Are you an orphan? I said, are you an orphan? The Almighty God is your father. And he said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. He has given that promise to other people before you. He never disappointed them. He's given the promise to you today. He will never disappoint you. In Genesis chapter 28 verse 15, Jacob was going away from home. And all he could think about was the hatred of Esau that he had against him. He was living certainty for uncertainty. He was living father and mother and his twin brother and he was going to a place he had never been before. The future world for him was something he could not determine. It was uncertain. Then in Genesis 28 verse 15, the Lord gave him the same promise that the Lord is giving you today. And behold, I am with thee, and I will keep thee in all the places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again unto this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee all. At that time, he had nothing in his hand. He had no property, he had no wife, he had no child, nothing. When he was coming back, the testimony of his mouth is, Thank God, I have enough. We need to look at it. In Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. In a reading from verse 9. A Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my, fa of my father Isaac, the Lord will say to me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. I am not worthy of the least 
of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become true bad. When you gave me that promise, I will be with you, I had nothing. Only a stick, a staff in my hand. You have fulfilled the promise, you are dependable, and become true bands as at now. Chapter 33, verse 11. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough, you will have enough. You see, when God gives us a promise, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, is the same promise he gave to Jacob, and he fulfilled it. And Jacob gave testimony, he said, God has been gracious to me, he never let me, he provided for me. Laban wanted me to lose everything, but as God was watching over me and watching over everything, look at me now, I have enough. The same way God was faithful to Jacob, he will be faithful to you. Joshua chapter 1 verse 5. Joshua chapter 1 verse 5. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. That same promise was given to Joshua. And as we look at the life of Joshua, all the battles he faced, Jericho walls fell before him. Jordan divided before him. Confederacies of enemy kings, they were defeated before him. And until he became old, he still was saying, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The Lord did not disappoint Joshua. The Lord will not disappoint you. What's the conclusion? In uh, chapter 13 of Hebrews, verse 6, it says, So that we may boldly say, He said, Now there is no more fear. Because I have God as my companion, a faithful companion, a protecting companion, and the one that is stronger and greater than all my enemies put together. Others like me in the past, they depended upon him. They were not disappointed. I am depending upon him. I will not be disappointed. Therefore, I will boldly declare. So we may boldly say in our family, and we can boldly say in the afternoon and the evening and in the night, there is no worry, there is no anxiety, there is no fear. So that we may boldly say, we can declare to, to the ears of the devil and the demons in town, there is something we believers can boldly say because of the promises of the Lord. The Lord is my helper. I said the Lord is my helper. Oh, they will say, you say you have been born again, you say that you are now a child of God, and you will not uh, worship the family idol, uh, go to that, uh, Jesus will help you, Jesus will help you. And uh, now you say you need money, and you know that family is here. You didn't know family, when we told you to stay in the family church, and you will not remain in family religion, and you say you got one new religion, uh, go to that God, so that he can give you money, God will give you the money. Now you are looking for promotion. Now you know that a uh, uh, manager is there. Now you can talk to director. So you know, uh, so I thought you said we were sinners. And you will never come to us. That it is God that will promote you. Go to that God. Let him promote you. God will promote you. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. I will not fear. What man shall do unto me? No witch can touch you. No harbadis can destroy you. Nobody with familiar spirit can destroy your life. The creator of the heavens and the earth is your constant companion. Anyone that touches you touches the apple of the eye of the Lord. How can you allow fear in your heart? How do you look at ordinary human beings and then you are running about? And you cannot live in your house that you rented anymore because uh, one a woman at the backyard in the kitchen said that is going to trouble your life. They are liars. The Lord will silence them. I want you to rise up. And I want you to say this after me. I can boldly say. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What man shall do unto me? And there is nothing for us to fear. 
In fact, there is nothing for us to be covetous about. Why am I going to covet anything? That thing belongs to my father. And if I tell my father, I will give it to me. Why will I be covetous? I will remain with my father. I will be contented with what he has given me. I will pray unto the Lord. He is my provider. He is my protector. He is the one that is with me all the time. He is my constant companion. I will stay with him. I will depend on him. I will rest on him. I will lean upon him. I will not be afraid of the devil. I will not be afraid of demons. I will not be afraid of witches and wizards. I will boldly say, The Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. There is, I will not fear. I will not fear. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. The Lord is on your side, my brother. The Lord is on your side, my sister. And you can call upon the Lord today. He is thinking about you. He will provide for you. There is nothing for you to fear. You can boldly declare it anywhere. The Lord will be your helper. He will support you. He will protect you. He will do good unto you. If God be for you, if God be for you, if God be for you, who can be against you? No one. You are victorious. Nobody can destroy you. And nobody can kill you before your time. Depend upon the Lord is watching over you.